topic that you've chosen to talk about, the rise of nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, um, is really, I think it's a fascinating topic to, to discuss because it's, it's for real. And, and just in starting this, you know, I look at it and say, how did this all happen? You know, and, and why did, was it to fill a void or was there something more sinister at work here? And, and, and you know, at the end of the day, I say, we're kind of going to get what we pay for. And, and it's not to slam anybody either. You know, I've worked with nurse practitioners, PAs who have been fantastic at what they do, but I've also seen a dark side of it too. And certain motivations to become an advanced um, degree provider. Um, and I don't like the, the term provider either. I personally don't either. I think it's really, that, that's another discussion, but you know, the, these advanced degrees trying to fill the role of a, of a physician but you know, over the years, I, I you know, you, you catch wind of, well, those doctors aren't that smart. We can do better, and it's like, no, you can't take, you can't make short, you can't take shortcuts in, in medicine. Well, you know, to answer your question about, you know, how these roles began, the answer really was that they did begin with good intentions. And both professions, nurse practitioner and physician assistant, were both founded around the same time, which was in 1965. They were both founded by physicians, and the idea was to put medical care into areas where doctors were not getting mm -hmm. able to go to underserved areas and to provide primary care. And initially, it worked really well, and that is an excellent role for uh, us to have what we call physician extenders to you know, reach a little farther to help more patients. But it didn't take very long before uh, things turned, I wouldn't necessarily say sinister, but began to overstep really what the original intention of the profession. So from going from we're here to help and to work under physician supervision, it became, well, yeah, why can't we do this exact same thing and we can just do it in a fraction of the time. And then over the last 50 years, we've seen uh, the profession change from one of working under physician supervision to these professionals wanting to practice completely independently and we have legislatures in nearly half the states in the union that are permitting the unsupervised practice of medicine, essentially, by non-physicians. You know, when I said sinister, you know, I too, always, without, oh, sorry, I just I want to make, follow up. okay, go ahead. I, I just want to make a quick point, you know, when I said sinister, it was really referring to maybe the, the payers, were they driving some of this? Because you know that they're not, be, they're not, they're not reimbursed the nurse practitioners at the same rate as physicians, so that kind of, well, kind of brings that whole part of the discussion um, forward too. Anyway, well, sorry, are, Naran. That's okay. They are going to now. I mean, we have a couple of states that have uh, pay parity, essentially. Oregon has passed it. Washington's working on it. And all of my local legislators are, are working towards it. One of them even wrote it appallingly. So again, we're going to get pay parity across the, the country as well. So it's not going to benefit the insurers in the long run. Um, it's going to benefit the hospitals, however. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is after Rebecca usually, um, you know, talks about the fact where it started and, and where we are now, I love to talk about the Burlington randomized trial, which if you've read the book is, in my opinion, the ideal situation where this idea of physician extenders should work. And it was in Canada, and it was in a province where they didn't have enough doctors, and this two physician practice had a waiting list. They, so they said, hey, we've got these great RNs that have been working for us for years. Let's send them back to school for a year and have them do our chronic care follow-up patients. Maybe we can alternate. You see this diabetic patient, and three months later, I'll see them. And, and so it kind of can offload the volume, and they were able to increase their ability to take patients by 22%. So it is a solution, in a way, to areas, rural areas, where you don't have enough doctors, right? It can extend mm -hmm. my reach um, or Rebecca's reach. I happen to be in a rural area in a, in a private practice. So again, it really helps me extend my reach and have the ability to extend past the 3,000 patients I already have. And so it would be great to do that. However, the problem is we've, we've gone sideways a little bit and, and now profit has entered the mm -hmm. arena in a way that we've never seen before before. We have online diploma mills that are making so much money and they're not providing much. They don't provide preceptors. They don't provide clinical teaching. They don't provide mm -hmm. essentially any education that allows anyone to go out and, and practice medicine or practice advanced nursing or whatever you want to call it independently. And so they're making money. No one's policing them. No one's policing the hospitals, which are encouraging everyone to do extra imaging, extra labs, extra visits. And then, you know, on top of everything else, like nobody's protecting the patients. And, and 
and physicians have always protected patients. So we're going to have to step up and, and at least share with the public what's going on, which is the whole reason Rebecca and I wrote the book. Well, I think, I think you make a good point. One, it's medical ethics and two, it's medicine. It's the dollar bill. But uh, uh, one of the points I think that you two are obviously younger than we are, at least me anyways, <laughs> but uh, I think that's the whole key is that physicians now have always been cats. You know, you can't hurt us. We're all our own independent contractors, our own entrepreneurs, so to speak. And I think we have to step up and come to the forefront and fight for what we think is right, whether that's and first of all, it always has to be determined by what we feel is right for the patient. Always the patient. And I think that's gotten lost, at least to me, in the last, I don't know, 15 years. But I agree with you. I think that's, and especially in a circumstance like you say, if you're in a rural practice as an extension, uh, helping uh, patients in skilled nursing facilities or, you know, you're talking about probably in Canada, I did not read that, but it's probably British Columbia or somewhere out Saskatchewan or maybe Nova Scotia, I don't know. But it, 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 uh, it makes great sense to me 